So, styling curves il illustrate one simple thing. It illustrates the relationship between cardiac contractility, which, re re which is reflected by stroke volume, with end ventricular and diastolic volume. And it says that your contractility will increase with increased end diastolic volume. Okay, so it's going to be like this. This is going to be your curve. Um, and I'm going to explain the reason for this. The reason is because of the length tension relationship. Okay, that's length tension relationship of the cardiac muscle. Now, if you have a very small length, that is, the muscle is not stretched out at all, which means that there's low end diastolic volume, because remember, end diastolic volume is what will stretch out that ventricle, then your heart's heart muscle fiber is going to look like that. You're going to have a lot of overlap between your, your thin filaments here. You can see the Z line here is going it's almost budding into that uh, thick filament. So you can imagine, once you get that power stroke, this is going to be rubbing over each other. This is going to be bumping to this. You're not going to get a very powerful stroke. So you have very poor tension that is generated, aka poor contractility. Now if you um, stretch out that, muscle, that heart muscle a little bit, increase length here, because there's more blood, so it's stretching out that ventricle, ventricle. Then you see that the thin filaments here have a lot more space. There's a lot more space here between the thick filament and the Z line. And so when you do, when you do that power stroke, you're going to get a lot more tension. And so that this whole this whole key concept here is um, reflected in the Starling curve, which shows that your end diastolic volume um, will, as that increases, your stroke volume will increase as well. Now a couple things can shift the Starling curve. I'm gonna draw it out. So there's there's agents that can increase your heart contractility. It's called positive inotrope effect. And when that happens, then your curve will, will get shifted up. So this is what's going to happen with a positive inotrope. And then if you um, if you get uh, some, there's some things that can decrease the contractility. It's called negative inotropes. So this this is what will happen here. And basically, if it's a negative inotrope, that means that for a given endostolic volume, you're going to get less less blood that's going to be pumped out because there's less contractility. So this is something like, for example, heart failure, when the muscle stops working very well, and that can be um, a negative inotrope. And then for um, the positive inotropes, you can have medications such as um, dobutamine or catecholamines, so like norepinephrine, that can increase your inotrope effect. Okay, so now we will go on to cardiac and vascular function curves, which are very similar ideas. The cardiac function curve is essentially the Starling curve that we just covered. You can see that cardiac output, which is pretty much the same thing as um, stroke volume. It's just remember, what was the, what was the fun, uh, formula for cardiac output? It was, remember, it was stroke volume times heart rate. So cardiac output, and then you have end volume or right, right atrial pressure. So if you focus only on the cardiac function curve, that's the exact same thing as the, um, as the Starling curve. Now the other thing to take note of is the venous return curve. This is the blue one right here, so it's venous return. And it shows you the relationship between venous return and right atrial pressure. So actually, let me change the color so it makes more sense. Right atrial pressure. Okay. So the, the whole key point here is that um, Venous return is higher when there's low atrial pressure. And why is that? Well, that goes over the key concept again of the flow equals the delta, the pressure gradient over the resistance. So when the right atrial pressure is lower, your pressure gradient is, is uh, increased. Okay, The higher the pressure is, the less likely that venous return wants to go back to the right atrium. So you're going to see that the, the venous return is going, to, is going to decrease as the uh, right atrial pressure increases. So that's the vascular function curve. Now, venous return and cardiac output must be equal. It has to be. It has to be that way. Otherwise, it's just physically, physiologically impossible for your cardiac output to to increase to be um, greater than your venous return. It's just that then that means that supply is greater than or demand is greater than supply, and then it's going to equal out. So. The cardiac output, which is shown by the, the red, and the venous return, which is shown by the, by the blue, 
are going to equib- uh, equilibrate. And they're going to equilibrate at the inter- intersection of their two curves. So that's going to be right here. So this intersection of the two curves is what matters. And this is what tells us where the steady state of the heart is for a given cardiac and venous function. Okay, so for this given cardiac function and this given vascular return curve, your heart, your cardiac output will be right here. And your end diastolic volume slash your right atrial pressure will be right here. I just want you to point out that all these factors are related. Remember that cardiac output is primarily, primarily determined by end diastolic volume as we saw in the Starling curves. And then end diastolic volume itself is, is highly affected by venous return because if you have more venous return, you get more end diastolic volume. And then um, end diastolic volume will also determine the right atrial pressure because, again, that's just related to how much venous return is going to the right atrium. Now, the other thing I want to talk about now is how how these curves will shift. So we talked about increases in, uh, how increases in contractility will shift our curves in the Starling curve. Um, specifically, remember that was the positive inotrope. So how will that sh- shift our curve? Well, we're going to shift our cardiac function curve. So we're going to remember that shifts up. So positive contractility. Now we have a new cardiac function curve here. And remember, what's important is the intersection between the cardiac function curve and the venous return curve. So now we're going to uh, look at the new intersection. And so how will our cardiac output change? We see that the cardiac output has increased. And how will our, our right atrial pressure or endostolic volume change? We see that it has decreased. So that is the new steady state cardiac output versus um, end diastolic volume function. You don't have to memorize everything. You just have to understand how different factors will change um, the contract, how, will, how different factors will change each curve. So I'm going to take a look, quick look at uh, what happens when we decrease contractility. Now let's, let's change our pen again. So decreased in contractility, just like we saw in the Starling curve, decreased contractility. We're going to look at the new intersection here, and that is here. So now you you see that cardiac output is decreased and end diastolic volume increases. Again, because your heart is pumping less, so there's less cardiac output that's being generated. And because you're not pumping out enough, there's extra extra fluid in the heart that's just hanging out there. So end diastolic volume increases, there's more fluid, so right atrial pressure increases. It all makes perfect sense. If you, and if you know how to draw the Stalling curve, you will understand it. Now we're going to look at changes in the vascular function curve. How will that change? Well, the factors that change the vascular change our pen here. The factors that change the vascular function curve include include volume and venous tone. Okay, increases in volume and increases in venous tone will increase the venous return. I hope that makes sense to you. I want to explain the venous tone one. Because remember what we said about the veins being high capacitance? So if you decrease the venous tone, they're going to be extra floppy, extra stretchy because they have, they have poor tone. And so more blood is going to hang out in the veins. So if that happens, if you have too much blood hanging out in the veins, you have poor venous return. But if you increase the venous tone, they're going to, get, they're going to be more stiff. They're not going to hold as much um, uh, venous blood. And so more, they're going to get more venous return to the heart. So that's why your vascular function curve has shifted up. And so changes in venous tone include sympathetic activity. And thus, the intersection shifts. And I don't need to explain this anymore, I feel like. I just want to explain how the curves will shift now. So what will cause a decrease in vascular function curve? Well, obviously then, the decrease in volume or decrease in venous tone. And that's going to shift it down. And again, you're going to look at where the new equilibrium is. Okay. So one more thing. Let's clear all this. The final one I want to look at is how changes in peripheral resistance will affect our curves. This one's a little more complicated. So pay attention. Let's say we decrease our peripheral resistance. How will that change our cardiac function curve? How will cardiac output 
change for a given and thus how will contractility change? Well, decreased peripheral resistance means that you have decreased the afterload. So your cardiac function curve is going to increase because there's less resistance. There's less afterload resisting the heart from pumping. So you're going to pump out more. How is that going to change our venous return? Well, decreasing resistance is going, to decrease, is going to make it easier for blood to flow through arteries and veins all the way back to the heart. So you're, going to uh, you, you're going to open up that highway. You're going to increase a lot of, a lot of lanes. And so all that traffic is going to go down. You're going to have a lot more cars going through it for a certain amount of time. So your venous return will, go down, will increase as well. As you can see here now, we have a new intersection. That is the intersection of the, the new venous return curve and the new cardiac function curve. So what changes will happen? Well, obviously your cardiac output has increased. And whether your um, end diastolic volume increases or decreases depends. It kind of just depends on how much each curve is, uh, is changed. But um, the main thing here is that the cardiac output is increased. Now, if, if you increase the total peripheral resistance, you're going to get the exact opposite. Okay, so what's going to happen to the cardiac function curve? So that remember that goes down because, okay, let's draw this out. This is decreased total peripheral resistance, increased total peripheral resistance, total peripheral resistance. So cardiac output decreases because there's increased afterload. So your heart has to work harder. It's, it's, there's more resistance. It's pumping. How will the veins return change? Well, now you just increase your traffic a lot. You decreased like f five lanes on the highway. So now there's a lot more traffic. And so you're, there's less venous return. So that shifts down. So as you can see now, we have new, we have new intersections. This is our new intersection here. So we see a decreased cardiac output with increased total peripheral resistance. So that's it for our Stalling curves and, vas and cardiac vascular function curves.